All right, welcome to the last video in this sequence. Here we're going to look at dynamic optimization. We already saw we have this force distribution problem, and we used static optimization to solve it. So static optimization, we are looking at just one instance of time. That gives us good information, but only for that instance of time. What if we wanted to look at, for example, how far a model could jump? Well, looking at one point in time isn't necessarily going to tell us how best to coordinate the muscles to produce the maximum jump for this entire movement. We can use dynamic optimization to do that. So here's what it might look like in terms of a solution process. We start off by selecting a candidate solution. Suppose we have motors in our model that represent the action of our muscles. And so each motor will be generating a certain torque over time. The candidate solution might be a description of those curves over time. So we'll have a candidate solution. We run a forward dynamic simulation. We'll see how far does the model jump. We might ask other things like, how much energy did it consume? Did it get hurt? Other things like that. If it's good enough, then we're done. We found a good solution. Otherwise, we'll go back and select different motor torques and try again. You notice that within this loop, we're running a dynamic simulation. So this allows us to include in our objective function, when we evaluate the performance, we can include things like metabolic cost, um, jump height, jump distance, things like that. And in fact, we know that during gait, for example, we inject a little bit of energy at just when the foot's coming off the ground so that the majority of the swing phase can be done in a passive way. You wouldn't be able to capture that with a static optimization procedure. So let's look at an example of using dynamic optimization to learn something about how humans move. This is work from Carmichael Ong, who was trying to predict how a model could jump the maximum distance. So here's the human-like model. The model is planar, and there are four motors that represent the action of the muscles that cross those joints. We have one at the ankle, one at the knee, one at the hip, and one at the shoulder. So within this workflow, he'll run a forward simulation and then evaluate the performance of that simulation. In this case, how far did the model jump? Did it get hurt? And some other things. We'll look at the optimization problem in just a second. And then he asks an optimizer, in this case, a covariance matrix adaptation optimizer, what should the control parameters be or what should the control signal be for each of the motors in this model? So these control signals might be yeah, between negative 1 and 1. You might think of them as the torques generated by the motors over time. Somehow you need to describe what those curves look like. It might be control points over time. There might be basis functions or whatever. And you'll keep doing this until the performance is good enough. Here's the optimization problem that he posed. So he's minimizing negative d. d is the distance that the model jumped. And he's minimizing the negative of that. So he's trying to maximize the jump distance. And there are some other terms in the objective function. These other terms avoid undesirable solutions. For example, solutions where the model might get injured. So there is a term for that. There's a term to avoid having the model slip when it lands, et cetera. So you could add a bunch of other terms here, depending on how the optimizer is performing. And you'll notice these terms are weighted. We have weights w1 through w4. These tell the optimizer how important each one of these terms is. And these terms might also be in different units. So you'd also want to normalize the units somehow between, say, seconds versus Newton's. The constraints in his problem, he has, uh, these are Newton's laws, F equals MA. So he has Newton's second law. And he also has bounds on the activations of these motors that represent the muscles. He was actually looking at how we could augment the body to make humans jump further. Before doing that, he validated the nominal jump, so the jump without any augmentation. On the left, he's looking at the extension torques from the hip, the knee, and the ankle over the time before takeoff. So once again, this is kind of the wind up and the pitch. This is the counter movement. And then at zero here on the right is where the toe comes off the ground. There are experimental data shown in the gray shaded region, and the simulation is the black line. So you could perform some calculations to compare how close these lines are and so on, and make some judgment about whether you think the model's good enough and whether the optimizer is performing well. And he also looked at the ground reaction forces. So once again, we have some experimental data in gray and the simulation in black. 
And once again, you could do some calculations to see how close these lines are, and you can kind of eyeball it. Uh, it depends what you're looking for and what it is you're trying to accomplish with your model. One interesting thing that he used as validation for his model was that the optimizer predicted a counter movement. If you think about trying to jump far, what are you going to do? Very similar to throwing a baseball really far or trying to jump really high. There will be some wind up. Okay, there, we, we call that a counter movement. So you notice that the model does a crouch before taking off. He didn't tell the optimizer this is what the model should do. It found this solution. So that's kind of a neat way of validating these results. And here's the model once the device has been added. The green circles indicate the amount of torque that the device is adding at the ankle, knee, and hip. And the model jumps further. So just to recap, what did we see in chapter 9? Well, we saw the muscle force distribution problem. We have more muscles than degrees of freedom in the body. And so somehow we need to figure out how these muscles are coordinated. We can use static optimization to do that, looking at just one instant of time. But not every movement can be evaluated just looking at one instant. We can use dynamic optimization in those cases, looking at an entire simulation. So this is the end of the last video for chapter 9, and also the last video for part 3 of the book. I hope you've enjoyed these videos, and let's jump in to part 4.